Good morning and welcome. It is 10 o'clock. It is the fifth day of October 2021. What an amazing evening we had last night with the lightning and thunder here in Ventura County. Unfortunately, we are suffering for it now with the mugginess and my allergies. And you can tell by the picture we are discussing Wizards of the Coast, uh, Feywild, Adventures in the Wishlight, and what future shenanigans Wizards of the Coast are up to. They have clarified some of the things that they said last weekend, and we're going to go over them. This comes to us directly from Jeremy Crawford, the head designer, the head lead of uh, Fifth Edition and Wizards of the Coast product in general, the end all be all five end of the road, the buck stops here of 5e. Not the other guy. Jeremy Crawford is the man, at least where it comes to 5e. And we could already see, we've got this picture here of a bullywog knight, and he's dressed up when he's smelling a flower, and he sort of looks like a French... Uh, you know, for somebody who claims Wizards of the Coast is trying to get away from discriminatory images and changing up the races and stuff like that, Look what you've done, the bullywog, because, you know, that that's a pretty discriminatory image right there to LGBTQT and uh, French people and just a general sort of look that is sort of associated with a certain personality type. And yeah, and I mean, bullywogs were fine. Why did you change them? Why do they need to be changed? You had this, this you know, swamp dwelling um frog people who had their own society and now you've turned them into something else but we will go on and content warning since this does involve fifth edition jeremy crawford and wizards of the coast and i am always interested and sometimes less than flattering when i talk about wizards of the coast and the choices they make if me saying less than flattering things about wizards of the coast is something that might trigger you Stop watching now, because we know I've got some strong opinions about this. The most recent D&D book, The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, features two new playable races and a gaggle of Feywild monsters and NPCs. In this installment, I, Jeremy Crawford, head of D&D Studios Game Design, talk about some of the rule evolutions presence in these new options and what it means for the future stat block refinements. Over the past year or so, we've been refining the D&D stat block to make it easier to use and to prove how DM-controlled creatures functions in play. The following sections describes the main changes we've made. You can find these changes in Witchlight, Fizzbins, Strixhaven, and Mordekane Presents Menagerie of Multiversal Monsters of Menace. <laughs> That's not the name, I know, but as I said, I'm going to keep playing with this name. All right, so how is this different than previous stat blocks? Uh, armor class, hit points, speed, stats, saving throws, senses, languages, challenge rating, uh, abilities, amphibious, speak with fro actions, other things, bonus actions, I don't know, recharges after short or long rest, how uh, medium humanoid, typically lawful good. How is this different? It looks exactly the same. I don't see any changes from older stat blocks. It looks exactly the same. Okay, moving forward. Creature types. Creature types are now always capitalized. We've made this change so that it's easier to tell in our rules when we're talking about a monster of a certain type. A giant, for example, would be capitalized. We would capitalize the G rather than using the word in its normal since she was a giant in the community. Uh, so that means you haven't been capitalizing the name of creatures. Blargar the giant was lowercase. It's, it should always have been capitalized. We've also gotten strict about which monsters get the humanoid creature type. This type is now reserved for creatures who are human-like in their moral and cultural range. So this means if you are not human-like in their moral and cultural range, you're no longer a humanoid. You're now, I don't know, a fiend or a fae or a monstrosity. So even though you have two arms and two legs and a head and are generally usually a mammal, which is the definition of humanoid, Two arms, two legs, upright standing, a head, and most of the time mammal, 90% mammal. 
the definition of humanoid. That's not it anymore. According to Jeremy Quafford and the Wizards of Coast, now the definition of humanoid is creatures who are human-like in their moral and cultural range. What the fuck does that even mean? Human-like in their moral and cultural range. So an advanced society of, I don't know, lizard people who have, I don't know, uh, you know, created medicines and technologies and communications and politics far, far better than anything, you know, a, a guy who lives in the Shire might have created. But if they do not fall within what you consider the moral and cultural range of human-like, which I don't even know what that means, because what is the moral range of humans? Uh, are you aware what's going on in the world generally? I mean, the moral range of humans is pretty awful generally. And cultural range? What does that even mean? What is what is the cultural range? I mean, because are we talking culture as defined by location, i.e. the culture of people who live in San Antonio is different than the culture of people who live in Ventura County, who are different than the culture of the people who live in Paris, France, or are we talking about cultures like uh, agrarian culture, barbarian culture, medieval culture, democratic culture? Because uh, I know, you know, for somebody who, you know, claims you're trying not to be very discriminatory anymore and trying to embrace all races, creed, colors, and colors, this feels incredibly, incredibly restrictive incredibly shoehorning, incredibly prejudice. Basically, if a race of individuals in the D&D multiverse does not fall within what you, Jeremy Crawford, and the other maniacs over at Wizards of the Coast feel are the human-like moral and cultural ranges, they are no longer defined by, by the definition of humanoid. Fuck science. Fuck the English language. Uh... Fuck evolution, fuck Darwinism, fuck anything. I, Jeremy Crawford, and the geniuses of Wizards of the Coast can now decide with our magical editorial wand, you're a humanoid because you fall within the cultural and moral norms of humanoid things. So uh, raping your own sister, well, that's something that humans do, so I guess that's okay. But you're not humanoid, even though your culture is agrarian, peaceful, has it created advances in technology, uh, but you don't fall within the moral and cultural range of what I, Jeremy Crawford, lead designer of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, feel is humanoid or human-like. What the fuck? So from now on, monsters that used to be humanoid can now be monstrosities, fey, fiendish, undead, sandwiches, I don't know. Alignment. Okay. Take a breath for this one. Alignment had a time out on the stat blocks of Candlekeep Mysteries and Van Richter's Guide to Ravenloft. We omitted alignment in those books as a temporary measure. Temporary measure. No, no, you said alignment was going away forever because it was restrictive and discriminatory. This giving us time to determine how to handle alignment going forward. Now that we've done the work, you didn't do any work. Your product didn't sell, so now you're changing back, hoping that this will make up for it. Now that we've done the work, alignment returns in Wild Beyond the Witchlight, and it appears in all our other upcoming books until we change our minds again. So why did alignment get a timeout? A timeout? Really? We don't even use that anymore in education. Nobody gets timeouts anymore. Maybe they do in your house, Jeremy. Maybe that explains a lot, but no. No, timeout is no longer a thing. For a while, there had been some confusion in the community about alignment's role in D&D. In the rules of the player's handbook, you choose your character's alignment, and then the rules of the monster manual, the DM determines the monster's alignment. No matter what alignment is chosen, a creature's alignment describes that creature's moral outlook. Alignment doesn't determine the creature's behavior. Alignment is essentially a role-playing game. Both books are clear about the player and the GM having the final say in alignment, but both books also plant a seed of doubt. The player's handbook suggests alignments for various folks in the D&D universe, and the stat blocks in the monster manual include alignments without reminding DMs that those alignments are merely suggestions. 
To eliminate the seed of doubt while preserving alignment's function as a role-playing dude, we've made the following changes. Only named human individuals such as Mr. Witch or Mr. Light have a de definite alignment. Generic humanoids bear the word any alignment, reminding the DM that such people have vast moral ranges. Magical creatures that have a strong moral inclination, angels, demons, devils, undead, and the like, have an alignment preceded by the word typically. For example, a demon stat block says typically chaotic evil. No, it's a demon. It's always going to be chaotic evil. Since that is typical for a DAD demon to be chaotic evil. The one word typically reminds DDM that the alignment is a narrative suggestion. It is an, an existential, existential absolute. The holy can fall and the fiendish can rise. Members of certain organizations, charitable nighthugs or diabolical cults, for example, all sometimes get a typical treatment. Creatures such as most beasts and oozes that are incapable of moral discriminant continue to lack an alignment and therefore bear the term unaligned. Beasts don't have morals. But... Demons can be good because a demon can be redeemed. When it's redeemed, you can change its alignment. Demons are in alignment, are chaotic evil. See, Jeremy needs to hold our hands because we're not capable of, com of, of coming up with the thought pattern that, hey, maybe for my story, I could make this demon good, even though we've been doing that in literature and gaming for ever so because we are not capable of coming up with these ideas on our own wizards of the coast is going to do it for us so they're going to say what is and is not because alignment was too confusing in the past mind you most four-year-olds and six-year-olds understood it but it was too confusing in the past so we had to make it go on a timeout so we could fix it no no no, you made it go on a timeout because of all the um, complaints you got from the SJW crowd, most of whom don't even play the game, who claimed that it was too restrictive and too discriminatory and was a, a, a role-playing block. My character can't kill all the NPCs in the village because my DM says that's an evil act. But killing all the PCs in the village is what my character would do so calling my act evil is discriminatory. You're, 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 you're preventing me from fulfilling my character's motive. Therefore, you're a horrible DM. This is racism. So please, Wizards of the Coast, make alignment go away so I can kill all the NPCs in the village and not feel bad about it. And alignment did go away in Red, Red Richter's Guide to Ravenloft and Candlekeep Mysteries because reasons. Oh, you're not evil anymore. You're misunderstood. Your actions can be justified. Sure, you killed everybody in that village, but it's okay. We can work it out. No, they, alignment came back because Candlekeep Mysteries and Big Richter's Guide to Ravenloft made you no money. And one of the main complaints was, why did you get rid of alignment? So now it's back. And instead of you having the free will to decide whether, you know, oh, you know, it would be good for a story if this demon somehow became redeemed like Spike and Buffy. Here's, a, I mean, a, a character trope that's been used throughout literature history. But no, you're not smart enough to come up with this idea for yourself. So we're going to tell you how to do it because we're Wizards of the Coast and we have your best interests in mind. Trust us. Moving on. Tags. Occasionally, a creature has a tag, elf, goblinoid, titan, or the like, that identifies an important detail that doesn't appear elsewhere in the stat block. We've begun introducing new tags, which some rules that I'll reference, allowing you to create fresh ways for creatures to interact with the game system. For example, some creatures now include a tag in the name of a spellcasting class, such as cleric, druid, or wizard, or monsters of the multiverse include rules that say such tag means the creatures counts as a member of the name class for the purpose of magic item entombment. So if a, I don't know, four-armed carrot monster has the cleric <clears throat> definition in his description, uh, in his tag, so it would be four-armed carrot monster, creature type beast, unaligned because it's a beast, uh, cleric. So it could use, remember, magic items that are attuned to only clerics 
So that means it has one level of cleric in addition to everything else? Or just it counts as a cleric as far as the magic item is concerned? And how would the magic item know that it's not a cleric? Are now all magic items intelligent and discriminatory and can tell whether people are a cleric or not a cleric? Oh, you can use me. You're a cleric. <laughs> you can't use me. You're not a cleric. Sorry, I'm discriminating. I only get used by clerics. Uh, no, I, I mean, so uh, what does this mean? Uh, so my forearm carrot monster, if I put the cleric tag in his name, can use cleric attuned magic items. But it's not a cleric. I mean, it doesn't have spell casting abilities because it's a beast. And you've said be beasts are unaligned and incapable of moral discriminant discriminants. I don't even know what that word is. Moral choices. So because my beast carrot can't make moral choices, it can't be a cleric because being a cleric is sort of defined by making a moral choice to follow the teachings of a divine being. So he does not have the spell casting abilities of a cleric or any of the other abilities of the cleric, but he can pick up a cleric magic item and use it. Mind you, I'm not sure how many magic items are out, out there that are specifically attuned to only one class. Maybe that's a thing. I don't know enough about Wizards of the Coast magic items now. Maybe they changed them, you know. Uh, generally, spellcasters could use spellcasting items, and non-spellcasters usually couldn't. But we're changing that. Moving on. Proficiency bonus! Many of the numbers in the stat block include the creature's proficiency bonus. Because of the fact that creature's proficiency bonus now appears in the stat blocks, the number sits to the right of the creature's challenge rating. So it didn't before... What? So, uh, you just, I mean, what? You're explaining why the math is different? I think everybody obviously just knew that or didn't care. I mean, why does this monster have a plus 12 to hit? There's no reason. It's a monster. It is a plus 12 to hit. I don't have to explain it. It's a monster. Why do I need you explaining why this giant is plus 12 to hit but only does a D8 plus 6? Well, he's proficient in axe. Of course he's proficient in axe. Bonus actions. If a creature has any bonus actions, the actions now appear in a section called bonus actions in the stat block. This section goes after action sections, and if a monster has a reaction section, the bonus action section now goes between actions and reactions. The new section makes it easier for DMs to spot bonus actions when running a creature, which previously hit among the creature's traits near the top of the stat block. Because, DMs, you're not smart enough to read, so we have to hold your hands and show you where the bonus action is. And it's going to be, be, be below the actions, because all the stat blocks are going to be the same, unless, of course, the monster has a bonus action and a reaction, then it'll be in a different place, because all the stat blocks are going to be different. Wizards of the Coast, we know what we're doing, and we have known what we're doing since 4th edition. Spellcasting! Since 2014, spellcasting creatures have tended to have a spellcasting trait. The innate spellcasting trait, or both. Starting in 2021, we have merged these two traits into an action called spell casting. This action now appears in the action sections of a stat box and has a few important qualities. So you have the spell casting trait, or you were an innate spellcaster, or you had both, but now we're just lumping it all together under spell casting. These actions now appear in the action section. And have a few important qualities. The spell casting action doesn't use spell slots. A creature can cast the action spells a certain number of times per day. That's always been true. The only spells that appear in a spell casting action are the ones that take an action to cost. If a spell requires a bonus action or reaction or a minute or more to cast, the spell must appear elsewhere in the stat blocks. This changes ensures the bonus actions is reactions, such as Misty Step and Shield, aren't hiding out in a list of spells. Because again, you're not smart enough to read. So we're going to hold your hand and show you where it is. We're more selective about which spells appears in the stat blocks, focusing on the spells that have non-combat utility. A magic using monster's most potent firepower is now usually re represented as a special, special magical action rather than relying on spells. I don't even know where to start. You've actually made something that you were trying to simplify 
far more complicated than it needed to be. For 40 some years, the stat block has remained unchanged other than, you know, as the additions changed. Zero edition orc looks pretty much the same as first edition orc. First edition orc looks pretty much the same as second edition orc. Second edition orc, pretty much the same as third edition orc. Third edition orc, pretty much the same as fourth edition orc. Fourth edition orc, pretty much the same as fifth edition orc until today. Now, I don't know. They're going to be completely different. The stat box, which has remained relatively simple, relatively easy to read, relatively easy to understand for 40 seven 48 years nope we're gonna change it because it's too hard to understand 48 years of the exact relatively exact same stat block but oh no we're gonna change it we're gonna actually make it more complicated in order to make it less complicated because we're wizards of the coast and we know what we're doing trust us remember fourth edition we knew what we were doing then Remember Ravenloft? We knew what we were doing then. We're Wizards of the Coast. We know what we're doing. New character races. There are two new character races in Wild Bum the Witch Site. The Fairy, which are not fairy. There are they're gnomes with wings because they're three feet tall. And the Heron Gone. Both appeared in Unearth Arcana and now in their final form in that book. The races have several characteristics. You'll see not only in the book, but also in character races in our upcoming books. These characters are explored below. Creature type. In the past, the creature race was presumed to have humanoid creature type. In the new races, the character's creature type is specified. For example, the fairy has the fey creature type. As opposed to being humanoid fey, you're now just fey. Because you're not humanoid because you don't have the moral and cultural relevance that humans do. You're not as good as us. Creatures type don't have rules themselves, but some rules in the game affect creatures of certain types in certain ways. For example, the Cure Wounds spells doesn't work on a construct or an undead, and it never has. When did anybody ever make the mistake to thinking that if they could cast Cure Wounds on a skeleton, the skeleton would get better? We know it doesn't. This literally hurts my brain. New ability races don't have the ability score increased trait that a player handbook races have. The new races instead rely on a special character creation rule that allows a character to increase one ability score by two and another score by one, or to increase three bi different ability scores by one. The lack of ability score increased trait helps make your choices for race and your choice of class independent for each other. Remember, your race doesn't matter anymore because we're all just humans in costumes. The very specific racial trait of a dwarf having a bonus to constitution because they're super hardy and super resistant to diseases and poisons and magic and the hardship of the world. Nope. Gone. If you want your or your dwarf to have plus two in his intelligence, no, he can't. The lack of abilities and score increased trait helps make your choice of race and your choice of class independent for each other. Broadening the types of characters we're likely to see in the game table. But, 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 my ism, I, but, but, my, my character development, I, I need to be a half-demon, but I don't want any of the restrictions of a half-demon because they're racist. So even though this says I get a plus two to my dex, I don't want that. I want that plus two in my charisma because I'm a half-demon bard and I want to seduce the school teacher. In fact, I'm going to spend four hours of the game trying to make this teacher my friend. And if that sounds silly, no, that is an actual scenario from the Strixhaven playtest that I read about where they spent the entire game trying to make one of the teachers their friend. And when one of the players was upset that they didn't have a charisma bonus because of their race... They changed it so they could have a charisma bonus because we don't want you to feel restricted if you pick an elf and the elf doesn't give you the bonuses you want. Just take whatever, you know, take plus one and three different score abilities because, you know, you're not an elf anymore. You're a human wearing an elf costume. 
But that's not racist. If you're having trouble deciding which scores to increase, we recommend consulting your class quick build section. For example, the car, the bar's quick build section recommends you increase your character's charisma <coughs> and dexterity because, oh, Lord knows they can't have any slow, fat bards or uncharismatic bards. I mean, there's no singer in history who's not very good, who, you know, isn't extremely appealing and uh, incredibly charismatic and just amazing. Uh, Tom Waits, Iggy Pop, Alice Cooper, Johnny Rotten. Yeah, those guys definitely all had high charismas and high dexterities. Jello be awfully. Yep, there was an extremely dexterous and charismatic guy. Yeah, just, yeah. I... Literally hurts my brain to read. Age. New character races lack an age type. We instead now provide the following texts about characters' lifespan. The typical lifespan of a player character in the D&D multiverse is about a century, assuming the character doesn't meet the violent ends of an adventure. Members of some races, such as dwarves and elves, can live for centuries. The typical lifespan of a player character in the D&D multiverse is about a century. 100 years. Humans can now live 100 years in D&D. Hobbits, 100 years or more. Gnomes, 100 years or more. If you're a player character, you get to live for 100 years. If you're not a player character, then your race still ages as normal. So I want my elf to be 99 years old, but not be affected by aging rules because aging rules are ageist. That minus to stat and plus to other stat because I'm old? No, that doesn't happen anymore. Nowhere in medical history is there any documentation that as you get older, certain things stop working and become much more fragile. No, 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 no. Fuck medicine. Fuck science. Fuck evolution. Age doesn't exist in D&D. You're 100 years old and you're perfectly fine. Alignment. Previously, the text of the character's race suggested an alignment for your character. Newer races contain no such alignment suggestions since the character's alignment is entirely under the preview of players. Remember, you're only humanoid if you have the human-like moral and cultural norms that we at Wizards of the Coast say are appropriate human, moral, and cultural horms, norms. Otherwise, you're a beast if you don't believe like we do. Size. Some new races, including the Haragon, let you choose whether your character starts medium or small, reflecting to the fact that some races gain an intentionally broad range of builds. You'll see this choices in other races in the future. That's right. The Dwarven basketball team is now going to be a thing. My six foot two dwarves are going to be kicking ass on the basketball field. Oh, yes. Also, rather than suggesting height and weight in a race, we provide the following text. Player characters, regardless of race, typically fall into the same range of height and weight that humans have in our world. If you'd like to determine your character's height and weight randomly, consult the random height and weight table in the player's handbook and choose the row in the table that best represents the build you imagine for your characters. Player characters, regardless of race, typically fall into the same range as height and weight that humans have, which is 5'5 five five and 111 pounds is basically human average, 117 Obviously, that's not me, but your typical 18-year-old human, 5'5", five 5'6", foot five, five foot 120, 140, maybe 200 pounds. So that means if I want a 5'6", 6'2", six, six hobbit, but still get all the bonuses for being a hobbit, I can. Mind you, the, ex the, the definition of hobbits and why they are different is because of their size, and because of their lifestyle. That is why they were never noticed by Sauron and the forces of darkness in the Lord of the Rings because they were small and they didn't really do anything to attract attention to themselves. But not anymore. So once again, my dreams of the Dwarven basketball team can finally come true. And in front, at six foot three, 
Thorin Oakenshield. And behind him at seven foot four, Bilbo Baggins. Bam, bam, bam. Oh, yeah. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to field my dwarven basketball team. They will go against my team of skeletons who are all in combat wheelchairs. Languages. The new races lack traits that are purely cultural, so though they don't include a language trait. Instead, new characters start knowing common and one other language that you and the DM agree is appropriate for your character. Okay. So no race has an innate rat language anymore. We all know common and one other ra racial language. It doesn't have to be the race language of your race. It can just be whatever language you want. So you can be the elf that grew up around elves who doesn't speak elf. But you're fluent in common and dragon. Because that's what my character wants. And you have to give me what my character wants. All right, then there's some questions about the rabbit hop trait because already people have found ways to break it even though Witchlight has only been out for like 20 minutes. Is the rabbit hop trait a... Does it expand movement? The rabbit hop trait lets the Harrigan jump as a bonus action and the jump doesn't consume any of the Harrigan's normal movement. <laughs> I'm better than a monk. That fact is the why the treat has a limited number of uses between long rests. Oh my god, a Harrigan monk would just be able to just, oh, <laughs> just jump all, oh yeah. <sighs> is a rabbit hop a high jump or a long jump? Who cares? <sighs> it is neither a rabbit high jump nor a long jump. If it was either, the text would say. It's not a high jump. It's not a long jump. It's a rabbit hop. Hey, you, Olympic gold medalist with your world record in the high jump. Fuck you. If our rabbit can do it and it doesn't count as a movement action, it doesn't count as a long jump either. It's just a jump. Does the jump spell benefit a rabbit hop? Yes, the jump spell affects the jump distance in rabbit hop. How? It's no longer, it's not a long jump. A long jump and a high jump are defined by distance. But since it's not a high jump or a long jump, how does the jump spell increase the distance of something that has no distance? Are you required to jump the full distance of rabbit hop? You don't have to jump the full distance of the rabbit hop when you use it. We will clarify this intent in future pressings of the rabbit hop trait. Okay, that one, I guess. That one, I'll say yes. It should be defined if the rabbit hop says you can jump 15 feet and your character only wants to jump 10, then that should be said, yes, it do, you don't have to jump. You can control how far you jump. Though most people would just automatically assume that if it says 15 and I can jump, when I only need to jump 10, that I can and there's not going to be any extra movement. It's not like I'm going to jump 10 feet onto that ledge. And then through some type of magical interpretation of how the laws of physics work, continue moving through the wall because I have to move my full distance of 15 feet, even though I only needed to jump 10 feet. So even though there's a wall there, I'm going to go through it because this is video game fight game physics now and not actual physics where you can jump as far as you can jump if that's as far as you can jump. I mean, I can't jump 10 feet, but I know there are people who can. Okay, so there we go. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're going to read these and go, oh, OGGN, these are all perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with these choices. You're just letting your predeposed negativity about Wizards of the Coast judge your opinion. And that could be true. Maybe I am completely reading these wrong. And I know I've defended Wizards of the Coast in the past, saying things like, you know, on paper, the idea was probably good, but somehow it went from paper and the good idea to Jeremy Crawford's brain and then got spit out as this bullshit. So maybe, maybe on paper, this idea about creature types and agility scores and 
spell casting and tags and alignment and creature type and this very discriminatory image of this bullywog uh, an insulting image of this bullywog uh, made sense somewhere, somewhere on a table at a desk, somewhere in the offices of Wizards of the Coast, somewhere. These all make sense. And the idea is a good idea. It's a strong idea. It's a pure idea. It's an idea that needs to be coveted and, 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 and taken care of and allowed to flourish and grow to the point where that idea can be taken out to others and go, what do you think of this idea? And others can go, wow, that's really a great idea, Wizards of the Coast, or no, that's really a horrible idea, Wizards of the Coast. What the fuck are you thinking? Maybe in some version of the multiverse, since that's a word Wizards of the Coast is using now, maybe in some version of the multiverse, that happened. And these ideas made sense. To s because to me, and mind you, I am opinionated, none of this makes any sense. In fact, Wizards of the Coast, I'm going to say you have made something that was tended to be simplifying far more complicated than it needs to be and i'm an educator my whole job is trying to instruct others how to understand simple ideas and tasks like don't pinch your friends you're supposed to make things simpler Keep it simple, stupid. But you have taken simple ideas and made them overly complicated. We're going to change creature types because nobody understood that. Show me the one person, the one person who in 47 years consistently said, I don't understand this. 47 years, the, the creature types have not changed. But now, as of today, poof, we changed them because we're the risen of the coast and we know what we're doing. Alignment. <sighs> Fuck that. If you don't follow what we Wizards of the Coast say is human-like, you're no longer humanoid. We get to decide. We're Wizards of the Coast. We know better than you. We're not going to explain anything. We don't have to explain things to you because we're going to hold your hand and tell you how you have to do it. Because you're not smart enough to do it on your own. Because we're Wizards of the Coast. And we know what we're doing. Just look at Ravenloft. Ability scores, fuck that. Age, fuck that. Alignment, height, gone. From now on, all my dwarves are going to be six foot two. I'm putting plus two in their dexterity, and they're going to have as their background basketball scholarship. And that's where I will end this. That's where I will end this delve into the madness that is the brain of Jeremy Crawford and Wizards of the Coast because I've spent 37 minutes going over this nightmare. So I just want to end this with the image of a six foot two dwarf with a plus two in dexterity coming out to lead my Los Angeles Lakers to another win. Bam, 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 bam. Bilbo Baggins, seven foot two, three hundred and twenty pounds. Oh yeah, just yeah, yeah. Oh, it's happening. I'm warning you now. If I ever play fifth edition, six foot two dwarf, professional basketball player, it's happening. I am your guide to all things Wizards of the Coast nonsense. If you appreciate this content, let me know. If you don't appreciate this content, and I'm sure you mostly you don't. Let me know. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. Support me through Ko-Fi and Locals and generally just by telling me to have a nice day. I need to lie down because this has been 40 minutes of just ridiculousness. Oh, Wizards of the Coast. Oh, oh, Wizards of the Coast. Dwarven basketball team.